Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tyler Jacks. I'm the director of the Koch Institute at MIT. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have you join us for our first ever virtual Solutions Within Sight program. Obviously, we're under uh, very unusual circumstances here in, in so many different ways. Um, but we thought it would be an important, uh, this is an important opportunity to bring to you some exciting research that's taking place within the Koch Institute um, with our goal of trying to understand the disease COVID-19 and also provide new solutions for that disease. As many of you know, um, back in the early part of March, MIT, along with all other universities, decided to empty campus, sent students home, uh, and significantly reduce the level of research activity in order to reduce density on campus. Importantly, um, certain projects were allowed to continue, and, and very much at the top of that list of priority projects were projects that involved COVID-19 research. Of course, prior to this year, no one was doing COVID-19 research because the disease did not exist. Fortunately, our community of cancer researchers, um, an, an agile group of biomedical scientists and engineers, were able to pivot in many instances and apply their tools and their talents to the problems associated with this disease. Uh, and as you'll hear from my colleagues momentarily, uh, they're approaching uh, this problem at various aspects of disease management from uh, new ways to protect individuals in our society, uh, new diagnostic technologies, and new vaccines for the disease. Um, in addition, there's quite a lot of other activity taking place at the Koch Institute and at MIT more broadly uh, to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we won't be hearing from Bob Langer today, but in his lab, uh, they've been developing new personal protective equipment. In fact, you might have read that <clears throat> they've partnered with New Balance to produce new N95 masks. Um, in addition, Michael Yaffe and Angela Kohler have been developing uh, new strategies for treating the disease by targeting specific viral proteins. Uh, today, you'll hear from four of my other colleagues who are approaching problems, again, related to protection, diagnosis, and, and also vaccines. Um, I'm grateful to all of you who've joined us today, and I, and I hope you're safe and secure. We have 322 participants at the moment. Uh, that's by far and away the largest number of individuals who have participated in the Solutions with Insight uh, program. So thank you very much for joining us. Let me just say at the outset, the basic um, game plan will be that each of our four presenters will present their work, uh, give it some context, tell you where it came from, and uh, do that in approximately 10 minutes time. And then we'll have about three to five minutes for question and answer. Um, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to ask a question. Uh, and we'll tally those questions. And we'll get to as many of them as we can as time allows. Um, I will be asking those questions directly to the speakers. Uh, and then when one, one speaker is finished, we'll move on to the next. Um, again, thank you for being here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next hour or so of exciting science and engineering. Uh, to tackle what is undoubtedly the most pressing problem of our time, certainly at this moment. And we will uh, move on to our second speaker, who is uh, Salil Garg. And Salil is a Koch Institute clinical investigator. Specifically, he's one of the Charles W. and Jennifer C. Johnson clinical investigators. Uh, Chuck and Jen Johnson established the clinical investigators program several years ago, and, and we actually will be hearing from two of the uh, Johnson family clinical investigators today. Uh, Salil is uh, uh, MD-PhD physician scientist, and uh, in addition to his research at uh, the Koch Institute, he's also a pathologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and he'll be speaking about diagnostic tools for test and trace protocols. Salil, take it away. Thank you very much, Tyler. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone today and to talk about a project that we've just started in the last month that really grew out of a discussion that we had at the Koch Institute um, around some of the challenges we were seeing with uh, early testing with regard to the unique challenge that is this disease. So as uh, Tyler mentioned, 
Uh, just a little about me, I'm a KI clinical fellow and then have a second life over in the hospital where I practice as a diagnostic molecular pathologist. Uh, I actually give a lecture on molecular diagnostics for microbiology of viruses and bacteria over at Mass General Hospital for the residents. Uh, and during the pandemic, I've been in and out of service collecting covering molecular pathology testing, including uh, our current COVID-19 test at times. Uh, and so our current volume of testing is now at Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospital up to several hundred to the low thousands of numbers of tests per day, which I think is honestly an impressive scale up given we started at zero, but uh, obviously is not quite to the level we need to, to, to truly meet uh, the entirety of the need. And so uh, just a little bit about what we're doing for, test, for current testing uh, that's in widespread use, the kind of gold standard or canonical tests that most people are running are based off the CDC assay. And this is essentially a reverse transcription PCR. And what that is, is it's a specific amplification to try and detect nucleic acids from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so this, uh, this technique works now after some trial and error. Uh, and it works well, but it has a, a fairly long runtime, about four to five hours. And as we'll see, it though it has widespread use, it has limited the throughput. You know, I think we've kind of scaled up nationally to the level we'll be able to hit with this kind of uh, this particular type of nucleic acid test. And so the idea is really what can we do to go beyond that. Uh, there's some commercial players, of course, in this area that I thought I should mention for completeness and that you've probably heard about in the news. Uh, three of the most widespread used tests are the roche Cobas test, uh, which has a runtime of about eight hours and it has the advantage of actually being direct from sample. So you can uh, pipette directly from a patient specimen into a sample that goes into the machine. It's an automated workflow. It runs. Uh, in eight hours on the highest throughput COBOS machine, though, you can do maybe uh, several hundred tests, but certainly not into the thousands. Uh, Cepheid has come out with the, their gene expert technology, which a patient specimen is again pipetted into these little Cepheid cartridges. These are then loaded into their gene expert machines and uh, are automatically processed and resulted in that way. Now these machines come in several flavors. Some of them can only really process one or two specimens at a time. Some of them can process hundreds of specimens, but they do cap out at hundreds of specimens. And this you might have seen referred to in the news as the 45 minute test. Um, Abbott Labs has come out with a test that runs in as little as five to 15 minutes that runs on their ID Now machine. And again, can take samples sort of straight into the machine. So these tests are great and they've really filled uh, niches in the market. But one of the things about all of these commercial tests is that you'll notice they all require sort of vendor specific machines from that company. And they're often specialized in their use case or where we can use them. So the Roche machines tend to be at referral centers. The gene expert machines are great if you have one um, and they tend to be in use at emergency departments. The ID now machines tend to be used at a uh, doctor's offices or point of care. But none of these is really sort of a catch-all solution, I think, for how we can scale up to sort of workforce level testing. And so uh, just a, a brief note on who we are actually testing in the hospital right now. Um, the emergency department and inpatients, patients who are already admitted into the hospital have priority. And basically the highest priority is a patient who's already in the hospital or symptomatic and needs to be admitted. Uh, or and or who have new respiratory viral illnesses. In the early phase of this pandemic, that was really all we could test. And this is where you probably saw in the news and in other places, there was a lot of very understandable frustration around why folks couldn't get tested. Uh, now, as we've scaled from 100 tests a day to 1,000, at least at our institutions, we can go back at least a little bit and verify that previous infected people have now cleared their infection and are therefore safe for outpatient placement, for example. And we can test a limited number of outpatients not actually in the hospital who have symptom onset. And there is also some uh, research protocols currently ongoing for uh, monitoring the healthcare worker population and some other particularly vulnerable populations. Uh, but what I, I want you to take away from this is that actually 
the testing indications and who we're testing is really being limited by the whole throughput and availability. So it's true we're meeting these current indications and meeting this need, but it's not sort of adequate for workforce screening and, and meeting test and trace needs if for say you wanted to monitor the entire Koch Institute workforce because you were a junior investigator in the Institute eager to see your lab safely reopened if possible. Okay, so I wanna just explain a little bit about our idea um, and how it relates to kind of the existing canonical methods for detection. So that CDC test that all, most of the academic labs have adapted and uh, many of the reference laboratories are using a modified version of, essentially works in the following way. A patient has a nasal swab that's collected. It's dissolved in lysis buffer. RNA or nucleic acid is extracted from that sample, including from both the human cells and the viruses, and it's then run on a RT-PCR machine. So now there are two problems with that. The extraction kits themselves are a little limiting and the slots in that RT-PCR machine themselves are limited. There's only so many of them. So folks have tried to get around the first problem of the extraction kits by saying, well, let's just skip the kit step, take the sample and put it right on the RT-PCR machine. That actually works, but depending on exactly what region of the virus you're targeting and you know, your, your hands in your laboratory and how fast and how cold you keep things, you actually get a 30 to either a 30 fold to 1000 fold loss of sensitivity for the virus. And you can imagine as we start thinking about the phase of this pandemic where we worry most about folks who might be asymptomatic with a very low viral load, that could be a serious problem if people are walking around and they're negative because our test isn't sensitive enough and we've run out of extraction kits. So what we are trying to do now is to try and bridge both of these problems by taking nasal swabs, dissolving them in lysis buffer, and then trying to concentrate and purify samples using magnetic pull down. We're also trying on the back end to eliminate the use of RT-PCR machines by batching several thousands to tens of thousands of patients together for high throughput detection using next generation sequencing technologies. Now these have the disadvantage of being slow in terms of turnaround time, but the advantage of really being one of the only methods where we get enough data out of the machine that we could potentially really scale to tens of thousands or more patients. So I'll just describe a little bit in more detail what we're envisioning. So what we essentially wanna do is to have an all-in-one workflow where patient swabs containing viral specimen can then be placed one patient per well in something like a 96 well or 384 well dish. And all within one well, the virus is lysed, the viral RNA is captured, and we enrich for it with a magnetic step. Then within each of these wells, we can add a patient specific barcode. And after this step, all of the subsequent steps uh, can in fact be carried out pooled together for potentially many thousands of patients. And just to show you the sort of in more detail, this lice and capture step is really sort of the insight here. And so this is the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what you can see is that, you know, it has a virion structure and with these spike glycoproteins that give it the sort of canonical crown shape that gives it its corona name uh, in electron microscopy. And what we need to do is get the nucleic acid out, the genomic RNA on the inside. So within our capture wells here in the lysine capture step, the first ingredient is detergent just to pop these guys open. And then really our insight here is to try and capture the specific viral sequences with these bait sequences. And these bait sequences are then attached to a type of molecule called biotin, which has the special property that it forms very, very high affinity interactions with this other type of molecule called streptavidin. And so there are magnetic beads available coated with this this streptavidin moiety. And essentially the idea is we can capture and sort of pull out of the specimen all in one step, the specific viral sequences we're looking for to see if they're there. So once captured, uh, essentially the rest of the specimen can be discarded simply by inverting the plate on the magnet. And then we can pull things, barcode, sequence, and informatically 
potentially result to patients uh, very quickly from that point forward. So this is sort of just a schematic level overview um, and would be happy to take any questions on this. I just want to acknowledge the, the team that formed around this. Um, so, you know, myself in discussion with members of the community, we were sort of looking at this and I started chatting with particular, uh, in particular Patrick and uh, with, with support from Connor as well in the burn bomb lab in the biological engineering department at the Coke. And this really has sort of come together across both sides of the building to try and utilize some of their expertise in, in these sort of magnetic capture interactions and how they can be optimized to try and see if we can really skip these extraction kits, you know, that we're able to produce in the tens of thousands to hundred thousands per day in this country, but, but not in the millions like we might potentially need. So with that, uh, happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Salil. Very exciting. Uh, obviously, very important need right now. I agree with you that uh, getting back to work, getting back to school uh, is very much dependent on our ability to test, test widely. Um, a question, Salil, with respect to the practicality, do you think that these tests can be run locally, like within, a, within the Koch Institute or in a hospital, or will they have to be done at reference laboratories like the Roche test is done today? Fantastic question. I think we, in principle, have all of the material and equipment to do this at the Koch Institute. Um, you know, for, for tests that we're going to use for clinical purposes that would potentially be billed to insurance, there are regulatory considerations with, you know, having to do these things in a CLIA-approved laboratory. For workforce monitoring, it's not entirely clear exactly where that falls on the regulatory spectrum, and if we could potentially do that in-house if it's not a test that's guiding clinical treatment of individuals per se. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting area, and I think there are a lot of folks d discussing that along those lines. But I mean, luckily here, the actual technology itself, these, these sequencers, these high throughput sequencers are fairly ubiquitous. We certainly have several at MIT, and uh, many research labs and institutes around the country do. And, and the rest of the materials really are, are fairly widely available. So I would Great. love to see that happen. Great. So sort of a related question, <clears throat> you know, we all have been hearing about and reading about new testing modalities, a variety of different approaches to the testing question, including some coming out of MIT. What is the timeline, would you say, of a new test? And we'll use your test as the new test. What has to happen next for this test to be available for use, whether it be locally at MIT or, or more broadly? Great question. So the first step is to demonstrate that the test works on proof of principle samples you manufacture in the laboratory, the sort of artificial specimens. Uh, and then the, the process really is you apply for emergency youth authorization from the FDA. Uh, and that's for a test you wanna use clinically. Now their standard is to show that your test works equivalently to the gold standard with five positive patient samples and five negative patient samples adequately identified. Initially, they were also using a standard where they wanted sensitivity down to five copies of the viral genome per microliter of, of patient specimen fluid. That seems to have been relaxed in some cases as well, um, because as, as you mentioned, we're eager to get more testing modalities on, online. So, you know, I think luckily there was sort of a bit of a slow start in the regulatory space, but to their credit, FDA has been reviewing such proposals very quickly. So I think, you know, once the science is ready to go, it can be quite fast after that. Great. And you referenced sensitivity there. Do you have a sense of sensitivity with this test? Do you have any way to gauge how many viral mo molecules you can detect um, by this method? Uh, we are currently doing those experiments right now. Uh, so far, we're, we're fairly sensitive down to at least uh, 10 to 15 viral copies per, per microliter, but I think we can get even better up to or past sort of the gold standard with some optimization of, of the buffers and reagents. And, right. and then last question, Salil, um, you have focused on the nasal swabbing. Um, we've been reading about alternatives to the nasal swab as a source of material to test, including saliva. And I think there's one EUA test already approved for starting with saliva 
Have you gone down that path at all with uh, your technology? We have not tested saliva. I think that is absolutely fascinating, and I'm, I'm glad to see that that test seems to work, and I've read the literature around it with great interest. You know, I, I, I did, I will admit that I came at this with a little bit of the bias of a medical person, where, of course, the specimen from deeper in the oropharynx should be, you would think, more sensitive, just having you know, sort of deeper penetration, but, you know, it does seem like saliva could potentially be a good analyte. We, ha we haven't tested that yet, but we certainly hope to, and it's, it's a great idea. Great. I think we'll stop there. Salil, thank you, and good luck to you. Very important. You. Again, folks at home, give them a round of applause, uh, and we'll move on to our third speaker, who, as I mentioned, is also a Charles W. and Jennifer C. Johnson clinical investigator of the Koch Institute. Uh, this is Hojin Lee, also an MD-PhD, and uh, in addition to running his group at the Koch, he's an attending physician at the Dana-Farber, uh, as well as the Boston Children's Hospital Cancer and Blood Disorders Center. And uh, Hojin is going to approach a related question in terms of uh, diagnostic tests, but here moving away from viral detection and trying to determine whether somebody has been infected by detecting antibodies and specific classes of antibodies um, that respond to the virus. So Hojin, take, a look, take it away. All right, so thank you Tyler for the introduction and thank you to everyone tuning in to listen. Uh, today I'll be telling you about a collaborative effort here at the Koch Institute and MIT uh, where my lab is partnering with the labs of Sangeeta Bhatia, Mike Jaffe, Angela Kohler, and Hadley Sykes. So before I begin, um, I'll just give my relevant disclosures where MIT has filed a patent on this technology and I'm listed as an inventor. All right. So by now, most are aware that one of the US's major limitations in fighting the current pandemic is not enough diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Salil already went over this in great detail, um, but as many have seen in the popular news media, it really is all about getting more testing. So there are many ways to test for SARS-CoV-2, bottom line being that we need more of all of these different types. So we'll talk about what RNA testing is um, as a way of diagnosing active infection and between his work and the work of Connie Sepko, Mike Springer, Pardis Sabeti, Feng Zhang, and many others in the Boston Cambridge area, I think we're well on our way to in the near future having many great options for RNA testing. Protein detection testing is another way of diagnosing active infection and at MIT, there's also great work being done on this front, being most prominently led by both Lee Gerke and Hadley Sykes. But what I'll be talking about today is antibody testing, which is a way to determine if someone has actually mounted an immune response against the virus. Since the beginning of the pandemic, antibody testing has been hailed as a way to see who is protected from future infection and can this be used to help reopen society. So how do antibodies actually protect us from infection? For SARS-CoV-2, infection comes from the spike protein on the viral surface binding to a human cell surface protein called ACE2. That binding allows the virus to then enter and invade the cell, causing the infection. But protective antibodies, which are also called neutralizing antibodies, they can bind to the virus, cover up the important parts on the surface, and prevent the virus from infecting the cell. This is the basic mechanism for almost all of our childhood vaccines, as well as the annual flu vaccine. However, just because somebody has antibodies does not mean they're protected from that virus. The most famous of, ex of this example of this is probably HIV, where antibodies against the virus are made upon infection, but they don't actually prevent a few further cells from being infected. And also, in some circumstances, having antibodies bind to a virus without actually neutralizing it can actually make infection worse. And so examples of this would be dengue virus and Zika virus, uh, to name a couple. So for SARS-CoV-2, antibody testing right now really is the Wild West. In the past month or so, numerous tests that really work poorly have flooded the market. And for some of the worst performing tests, if you live in an area with a relatively low infection rate, a positive result on that test means your chance of actually having previously been infected is still less than 50%. And now I don't mean to denigrate all antibody testing that's come out. In fact, there have been some that have been quite good, um, but just the volume of testing for these antibody tests, it's still not adequate. 
there are improved antibody tests coming about. And so there's also great work in the area from Galit Alter, David Walt, and Hadley Sykes all coming to mind. But even with the best antibody detection tests, there is still the issue of whether antibodies are truly protective. So on the right, I'm displaying some example data where a group of investigators measured in plasma both the amount of antibody as well as the ability of the antibody to, uh, of the plasma to neutralize the virus. And although there's a general trend that more antibody means more neutralization, of the nine patients, you notice that one of them really did, uh, had high levels of detectable antibody, but really couldn't neutralize the virus very well at all. And in addition, there were three or four patients who had not very high levels of antibody detectable, but still had actually pretty good ability to neutralize the virus. And so this data came out of a study from the Netherlands, but there's been many other studies from around Europe as well as in China that have really pretty much all backed this, uh, to these types of trends up. And so errors in either of these directions in testing really are not something that we can tolerate. This is the gold standard of how we're going to open the country back up safely. So one might ask, okay, if these studies tested neutralization, why can't we just do that for everybody? And the answer is current neutralization tests are really hard to do. They're also really expensive and take a lot of manpower. In these neutralization assays, viral particles have to be made in very large quantities, which is very difficult and takes a lot of time and personnel. And these viral particles have to be mixed with patient plasma, which can't, can't just come from a finger stick, actually have to come from a full blood draw. Um, and then multiple dilutions of this plasma need to be made at a centralized laboratory where the test also has to, has to be done. And then finally, once these two are mixed together, that mixture is put onto uh, actual live cells. And after 48 hours or so, actually count how many of those cells were infected. So you can see just how much goes into our current neutralizing antibody assays and quickly recognize that this entire process is a non-starter for mass testing, which is also why these studies that have been published only did this test for just a handful of patients. So Guinevere Connolly from my lab started thinking about this with me in terms of what kind of medical testing platforms are out there that are fast, cheap, easy to do, and most importantly, are trustworthy. And the answer came to us in the form of the home pregnancy test, which is a type of test called a lateral flow assay. We knew Sangeeta Bhatia's lab had a ton of expertise with lateral flow assays. So we talked with Arnav Chabra, Liang Hao, Carmen Alonso, and Edward Tan from her lab to figure out how these tests actually work, what are the ins and outs of making them, and what considerations do we need to have when making a new one. So in the home pregnancy test, a sample is placed at one end of the strip, the liquid flows across by capillary action, taking along any pregnancy hormone if it's there. Flow across the strip encounters a color-labeled antibody that will bind pregnancy hormone. And then as it continues to flow, a second antibody targeting the hormone is immobilized to the quote-unquote test line of the strip. Then there's also a control line after that so you know the test worked properly. Two colored lines appearing equals pregnant. One colored line means not pregnant. But we needed a way to adapt this test, not for a hormone, but for an antibody, where the interaction we need to examine is the viral surface protein being bound by a neutralizing antibody and then prevented from binding to the ACE2 receptor protein. So we developed the following test. A drop of patient blood is placed at one end of the strip at the start, flows across encountering a color labeled viral surface protein that also carries an additional small protein tag that viral protein is then also carried across the strip by the liquid, and if no neutralizing antibodies are present, will bind to the ACE2 receptor protein that has been stuck to the non-neutralizing line. If neutralizing antibodies are present, they will bind to the viral surface protein, prevent it from attaching to ACE2, and flow on past the non-neutral flow past the neutralizing line to over to the neutralizing line where the protein tag will be caught by a special type of binding protein called a nanobody which has been adapted from a protein that really only exists in camels and sharks, oddly enough. And so development of this test really rel relied upon the protein engineering and recombinant protein production expertise of Ted Richards, Dan Lim, and Rob Wilson on the floor, as well as some major help from Hadley Sykes, who recently developed some technology 
that is able to attach non-antibody proteins onto paper strip membranes. And so one thing I didn't mention about the lateral flow assays is that essentially all of them in use today, they only work if you have an antibody that you can mobilize. So the, working with Hadley was really important to be able to get these non-antibody proteins on there. So this assay can say yes or no about the presence of neutralizing antibodies, but one thing to consider is that we still have no idea just how much neutralizing antibody in the clinical setting is actually required to fully protect against infection. So we really needed to be able to make this test into something quantitative that could then apply to the studies that are hopefully coming out soon for just how much antibody is needed to prevent infection. So we developed a second generation test where we have multiple neutralizing lines allowing us to actually quantify how much neutralizing antibody is there. As a simplified example, the second generation assay still starts with a drop of patient blood or even saliva since having antibodies in the respiratory tract is what truly protects from initial infection. The sample flows across the membrane and like before, if no neutralizing antibodies are there, the color labeled viral surface protein stops at the non-neutralizing line. However, if there is a low amount of neutralizing antibodies, some of the viral protein will be bound and some will not. The ones that are bound, those will be prevented from binding to ACE2 and they'll flow past to bind the first of two neutralizing lines. While the other unbound viral proteins, they will still stop at the first non-neutralizing line with the ACE2. So you'll get two bands, one neutralizing band, one non-neutralizing band. And then if there is a high concentration of neutralizing antibodies, all of the viral proteins will be blocked from binding to ACE2 and all of them will flow past the, uh, the first line. They will saturate the first neutralizing line and the ones that have not been able to bind because of saturation, they'll flow on further and bind to a second neutralizing line to give a second signal or a second band. And so based on some somewhat complicated calculations that I don't have time to get into today, we can actually determine how much of the viral protein to put at the beginning of the strip, how much ACE2 to have at the non-neutralizing line, and how much nanobody to put at each of five or maybe even 10 neutralizing lines so that we can capture a very dynamic range from no antibodies up to extremely high titer neutralizing antibodies. More neutralizing lines appearing with color means the higher the concentration of the neutralizing antibodies. So in terms of where we see this test filling particular areas of need, it could be used to serially screen previously infected healthcare and essential service workers who are at a high risk of getting re-exposed. We think this is important because all of the previous human infecting coronaviruses actually didn't generate lifelong immunity for the most part with protection dropping off anywhere from a couple years down to protection dropping off as soon as a couple months. We also think this test is a fast and easy way to see if vaccines are actually generating protective immunity and could also be a way to see when someone needs a vaccine booster if their protection drops off. Notably, our particular platform, it would actually dovetail very nicely with the uh, particular vaccine platform that Chris Love is gonna present after me. And finally, we think this could also be a quick way, uh, an easy way of screening convalescent plasma donors to see if they actually have protective immunity before they go through the whole process of plasma collection um, to ultimately treat critically ill patients. So with that, I'll conclude and acknowledge those who uh, were contributing to the work. Thank you also to Tyler, Lisa, Erica, and Tara for organizing this event. And a special thank you from both Salil and I to the Johnson family for supporting the Clinical Investigators Program. And so thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Ojin. Uh, <clears throat> let me get started. The, the, um, the technology approach assumes that the antibodies that you're detecting that block the interaction between the spike and the ACE2 are by definition neutralizing. How certain are we that that's true? So we don't know that yet. Um, we do know that you can block infection of cells by inhibiting the interaction between the spike protein as well as ACE2. There's some really awesome work going on at MIT as well as on the Harvard Medical School campus by uh, Alex Penelude as well as Lauren Walensky where they've developed certain peptides that can inhibit this uh, binding process. And that definitely uh, prevents infection in cells from the data that I've seen from them. 
Um, and so there certainly are potentially other ways in which antibodies or existing antibody immunity in the plasma could prevent the actual infection process, um, potentially by uh, inhibiting fusion and the invasion process. But I think we can be pretty safe to say that if you do have um, antibodies in high enough concentration that they're able to prevent binding of spike to ACE2, um, that's going to have a pretty good positive predictive value of whether, uh, whether you can prevent infection of cells. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we have a question here from one of our faculty colleagues. I, I'm not going to identify him or her, uh, but he's asking you not, not so much about your technology, but rather your opinion about some of the things that we're reading in the newspaper <laughs> about using antibody tests to evaluate the uh, prevalence of infection in certain communities like Chelsea near Boston. Um, what, what is your thinking about the, the state of those data? You referred to that earlier, but what's your current view about that? Well, I mean, I, I, it, it's hard because I certainly don't want to uh, say anything that will get me in trouble with some of my colleagues. Um, but I think one of the big things is that some of the earlier sero pan serology surveys that were done unfortunately fell victim to the fact that many of the tests that first came out on the market weren't as good quality in terms of sensitivity and specificity as one would have liked. And so there are definitely biases that were introduced in either direction. Um, in particular, I think the first, the biggest one that first came out was the study from Stanford. Um, and even those authors, um, they have uh, subsequently um, uh, admitted that there, if things could be done differently for their, their several thousand person survey that they definitely would have. It's just they were working with the technology that existed. And also too, unfortunately, one of the main issues in validating the, the, the rapid antibody tests that are out there is that we don't really have a good panel of gold standard, truly positive, truly negative, especially given the fact that depending on what seasonal viruses are going on and circulating, some of those antibodies could cross react and we really have no idea um, uh, whether or not a true binding event in those tests is actually from a SARS-CoV-2 exposure or from a similar virus that might have a similar protein. Um, and this is another reason why we wanted to take more of a functional um, approach in terms of identifying neutralizing antibodies, because we're actually blocking the interaction with the specific viral protein and the specific receptor, as opposed to just trying to identify uh, if an antibody is present, which is a lot harder, uh, given what we know now. And, and can you comment on the kinetics uh, <clears throat> of the appearance of neutralizing antibodies versus other types of antibodies? over the course of somebody's exposure to the virus? Yeah, um, so at least in terms of the limited data that's been coming out, the neutralizing antibodies, they seem to come up just as quickly, if not maybe a little bit delayed behind. Um, I can certainly see uh, as the affinity maturation process goes on that um, uh, there is potential that the neutraliz neutralizing activity could be increased um, by generating long-lived uh, memory B cells, however long they end up living. Um, but at least as of right now, the initial antibodies that are made that bind to spike, if they're going to be neutralizing, it doesn't seem that they take that much longer, if not the same amount of time to come mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that you other, that is somewhat related to that is that there's also a lot of research coming out now where the the spike protein, it's the most predominant protein on the surface, but there are other interior proteins that are seem to be in much higher quantities and perhaps even more immunogenic, such that a lot of the antibodies made in response to viral infection aren't necessarily to spike, but to something like nucleocapsid. Um, and so those, uh, if you're actually just doing an antibody survey, might end up being more powerful in terms of picking up prior exposure. Right. And last question, um, <clears throat> coming back to sort of the practical translation of the technology. Do you have a sense for, you know, if all goes well from here, when such a test might be available, how expensive such a test might be? You know, this seems like relatively straightforward technology, pregnancy test, lateral flow, pretty simple reagents. What's the expectation there? Yeah, so it's all about how quickly it can be scaled up. I mean, right now we're sitting in lab at the Koch Institute wearing our face masks and social distancing and just spotting these with pipettes onto paper strips. 
Um, and so you can only make so many of those at a time, right? And so we really need to establish some partnerships where we can mass produce these. Um, and in addition, in terms of cost, I mean, these are pretty cheap. Um, we've been fortunate that we're just now kicking up some stable cell lines to produce all of these proteins. And so, you know, your typical lateral flow assay, it definitely costs less than $10 to make, but in, in all honesty, I think we're probably gonna get that around to something maybe a dollar or so. Yeah, terrific. Uh, Hojin, thank you very much and, and continued success on the project. We're gonna now turn our uh, attention to our final speaker who's Chris Love, uh, one of our faculty colleagues in the Koch Institute. He's the Raymond and Helen St. Laurent Professor of Chemical Engineering. Uh, and he will be speaking about scalable vaccine development for low cost manufacturing and global access. As you'll hear, this, this project follows from a technology platform that Chris and his group have been developing uh, for applications across biomedical uh, research and treatment. Uh, and Chris has turned his attention to this and, and is making great progress. Chris. Super excited to be here. I think we've had the opportunity over the last three years to work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on a grand challenge grant that they had provided to us, along with the University of College London and Kansas University to rethink vaccine manufacturing, uh, really with the intention of thinking about global accessibility and low cost productions. Uh, it was a program that was focused on thinking through what's necessary to create platform manufacturing strategies for vaccines, something that doesn't exist today. And actually we had just had a kickoff in January to start phase two of this program uh, that was shifting its goal a little bit to think about how to accelerate vaccines uh, into the clinic from concepts and, and discovery spaces and some of the other areas that the foundation has interests such as HIV and malaria. And uh, in some ways, this has come at an opportune time for us in that it's provided this live fire uh, test of some of the ideas that we've been developing over the last few years together as a team. So I won't have all the answers for how to build a vaccine. This is a complicated problem. It takes a whole village to do this and that you will certainly have seen many examples in the news. We are thinking about this uh, in conversations with a number of different groups and the work that we're doing is one part of an, uh, an effort to try to bring forward uh, vaccine solutions to the broadest populations possible. And at the heart of this is manufacturing, and I'll touch on that as we go along. We've had a, a couple of schematics of the uh, spike protein that people have talked about in part of the structure of the virus. And this is the protein that forms a trimeric glycoprotein subunit on the surface of the vaccine that's important for it's binding to the ACE2 receptor. You may have seen this in the news as well. The ACE2 is uh, an enzyme that's part of a complex that helps control things like blood pressure and inflammation. Uh, this uh, receptor is present on the surface of cells in the lung as well as in a number of other compartments. And it's something that uh, is, is necessary for entry of the virus into the cells to cause infection. Uh, a number of different genetic screens have now come online to show that the evolution of the virus is such that there is very little mutational load in these uh, in these proteins on the surface of the cell. And in fact, alignment of these sequences to older versions of SARS suggests that it has undergone very little overall change over the last several years. So because this is important from viral entry into the cells and because it has a relatively low selective pressure on it as it, with respect to uh, uh, evolving that, that protein further, it becomes a really ideal target to think about for vaccine development. Next slide. So sometimes uh, you know, it, it's difficult to think about a vaccine because a vaccine at the end of the day is a product. And one of the things that's challenging from a manufacturing standpoint is oftentimes when we start from the discovery mindset, we aren't thinking with the end in mind. Uh, I've drafted here you know, something of a concept, what we would call a target product profile. This is sort of a description of what it is that we're aiming to be able to achieve. Some of these are obvious. We know that we want to target SARS-CoV-2. We'd like a prophylactic vaccine. The last one, the next one I think is, is something that's been in the news a lot is the target population that needs to be approached. And maybe the way that we've heard about this is in the context of R0. R0 uh, is the value of, of number of persons that you infect if you are infected with the virus. A value of two or three means that in order to really get protective immunity, we, we likely need to vaccinate on the order of 50 to 70% of the global population, which currently means a very large number of vaccine doses. 
other information on here of what we would like to be able to do. We want it to be high purity. It needs an adjuvant in order to elicit the right immune response. Which one we want to select is going to have implications because some may be more likely to cause complications in natural infections than others. Uh, and then we have some other information about how long it should be stable and under what conditions. Cost will be an important determinant. Uh, normally vaccines like this that are made at large scale are kind of a dollar to two dollars a dose. Uh, ideally, this is going to be as low cost as possible. And then we need to know something about the dose size, maybe 50 micrograms for a subunit vaccine. Uh, so what this means in total then is if we're looking to treat about 5 billion people at 50 microgram dose, and even just a single dose, we're going to need about 500 kilograms of this material. This is a large manufacturing volume. Uh, Erica, next. And one strategy for making low cost, high volume uh, vaccines is something called a recombinant protein vaccine. It's a part of a protein that's made recombinantly using uh, the best in biotechnologies for expressing that protein in high purity and the right form and combining it with another chemical, uh, an adjuvant of types alum is commonly used. In this case, there are many new adjuvants that are also being tested for COVID. Uh, and then there's other stuff in there, salts and excipients, so that it doesn't sting when you actually get the, the vaccine administered. And there's lots of successful products. Probably one of the more recent ones that's in the news is Shingrix, uh, made by GSK, as an example of this. Next. And so what this means is that we will need very, very large volumes of total product in order to cover the, the largest population possible. Next slide, Erica. I wanted to put this in perspective a little bit when we think about manufacturing. So the spike protein shown on the left, it's about 400 kilodaltons in total size. Monoclonal antibodies like Herceptin or Keytruda that are commonly used for treating cancer patients are about 150 kilodaltons. And typically for a, a product like this, you might make between one and 100 kilograms of that product per year. Uh, if it's a small cancer indication, you know, on the order of 10 kilograms or so. In contrast, insulin, which is a fraction of the size, we make about a thousand kilograms globally in total for all of the, the diabetic patients. And then you put that in contrast still to a small molecule like aspirin, which is uh, chemically synthesized rather than biologically synthesized. You know, we make about 40 metric tons of that product per year through chemical means. And so next, when we start thinking about what it's going to take in order to make a vaccine here for the right target population, thinking about a hundred kilograms or so, this is a pretty substantial amount of manufacturing capacity that's going to be needed to reach this metric next. But if we start to run some numbers and think a little bit about what manufacturing capacity can look like, if we had a process that could generate about one gram of our vaccine protein in about one liter of reactor fluid, and I had a 50,000 liter reactors I might have in a microbial uh, manufacturing facility, and maybe we get about half of that protein back after we purify it, that's about 25 kilograms per batch. And so we need very large reactors and processes that are going to be able to make large volumes of material in order to reach our, our target goals. Next. So as we think about that trade-off between the volume that we need and the size of the proteins that we can make, and there's some great mass balance calculations in there for those of you that are chemical engineers and thinking about this problem, the end of the day, we want the minimal subunit vaccine that's going to be possible to elicit the right response in patients. We talked about neutralizing that antibodies in, in the last talk and the challenges of raising those. We want to be able to focus the immune system to raising the right response to the right target. There's a little fraction of the total trimer, and it's shown here in kind of green and labeled with a red arrow is the receptor binding domain. This is a little part that unfolds as the virus gets close to the ACE2 receptor and it allows it to latch on to the ACE2 to enter the cells. This is a site that is known to elicit neutralizing antibodies. Uh, shown in the one image, there's a, a binder, a crystal structure of an antibody binding to that particular domain on one epitope, one surface of that, that receptor binding domain protein and another crystal structure on another surface, it's actually able to bind to the ACE2, which is the native, uh, native receptor. So antibodies that can bind this can actually lead to neutralizing responses. And previously for SARS has been demonstrated to elicit neutralizing responses in mice. About the farthest that these had been developed as a concept in part because the original SARS had faded out of, uh, out of, out of circulation. 
And so it's going to be elements around this that provides the right trade-off between manufacturability and antigenicity, while also reducing the risk for enhancing infection through antibody-dependent enhancement for the immunological aficionados out there. So to the next slide. We've been working to think about what it would take to, to go from these sequences to materials. And typically, if you've been looking in the news, some of the strategies with RNA and other approaches are relatively fast because you make the DNA or the RNA component, and then that becomes part of what you uh, are, are, are formulating into your vaccine concept. Here, we're interested in being able to make protein. And for the reasons of cost and otherwise, we think that this is still a good strategy to be able to reach the largest populations possible. But typically the timelines for developing a process for manufacturing a protein are anywhere from six months in the best case scenario to a few years. And so we wanted to be able to go really, really quickly. And there's a lot of work that we've done over the past several years as part of our Gates Foundation grand challenge to think about how to overlap many of these different stages. But at the heart of it is the ability to use microbial systems like a yeast organism to produce these materials and we can go very, very quickly. And so we, we got DNA sequences on Valentine's Day uh, and we had purified material within a month's time uh, of, of that material, uh, those, those sequences showing up that we were able to take forward into immunogenicity studies. So these are the kind of first stages of development of a vaccine to, to test to make sure that the idea is making sense. Normally you would be doing all of that work before you think about the manufacturing. But one of the things that we've been testing as a concept is bringing those ideas of manufacturing in line earlier in the whole process. And so shown here on the bottom panel is a lot of the things that we're starting to do to already intensify and accelerate the manufacturing process with the predictability of the yeast organisms that we've been using for production. And here we're leveraging some of the best tools for next generation sequencing, RNA transcriptional profiling to understand how these things uh, can be improved from one step to another in the manufacturing process. Next slide. We've developed a system at MIT that's a completely automated and hands-free production system for recombinant proteins. Uh, we built this under a program with DARPA to demonstrate recombinant protein biologics, and we've used it here to make manufacturing ready uh, examples of, of vaccine components. And just here, we've now, in the course of a few weeks, been able to manufacture and purify with an entirely new process that didn't exist before, uh, the receptor binding domain. You can see the intact mass spectrometry showing that we have the right material. It binds humanase 2. It binds to the SARS neutralizing antibody. And the quality of the material is sufficient for uh, further development of the immunogenicity and formulation studies. Next slide. But the yields of these processes haven't been what we wanted. So we went back in while we were getting the materials prepared and, and moving forward for immunogenicity studies to ask what was going on? Why did the cells not want to make more of the material than they were? We used RNA sequencing to identify pathways that suggested there were challenges in the uh, ability of the cell to process the materials coming out. And so in some ways we've gone fast to, or gone slow to go fast. We've reduced aspects of how we're feeding the cells in a different way to be able to boost the overall production capability of the system by about 5x. And we've also gone in and using some tools that we engineered as part of a, a consortium effort here at MIT with CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer those cells to also make more. And so we have two different levers, both through how we feed the cells and the in, intrinsic aspects of those cells to increase their productivity. Next slide. And so where we stand today, we have materials that I just showed you that are already in mice. We expect the early readouts on those uh, later this week uh, for how they've done in, in immunogenicity. We're testing multiple adjuvants with those as well as formulations of the stability of these components. Uh, we've now transferred strains that are producing these components or related ones that I've shown you to two different uh, large volume vaccine manufacturers who are bringing those forward for clinical development. The process improvements that we're making at MIT project out to about a gram per liter in fed batch processes. And so this is consistent with our goals of where we'd like to be to be able to create the right volumes of material. And then as you sort of might anticipate, this ability to go quickly through designs and concepts is allowing us to now test several second and third generation designs, both for enhanced manufacturing as well as enhanced immunogenicity. Next slide. And so I thought I, I might just leave with a couple of thoughts or, or 
open-ended questions uh, perhaps to consider too. As we've gone through this process, one of the things that we've observed is it's really hard to get materials around the world. Uh, it took us about four weeks to have strains that were ready to move towards CGMP production, uh, but it took us about another four weeks to actually get those to the first manufacturer that we were transferring them to. Downloading sequences is straightforward, making DNA is straightforward, uh, actually being able to move things around logistically during these types of situations is actually quite challenging and something that needs uh, some consideration. One strategy for this might actually be to think about establishing uh, more modular facilities and processes for manufacturing of vaccines, something that's not done today. Every vaccine is built in its own special plant with its own special process uh, for its own purpose and repurposing those facilities in various parts of the world to, to a circumstance like this one is really quite challenging. And then finally, I think we're now in a, in a generation where it's possible to read and write biology in ways that we've never been able to do before. And with some of the uh, older technologies for developing cells that would express these proteins are things that could be rewritten today in, in kind of new ways. And I think there's a real opportunity to invest in a host biology that is allowed to make these types of proteins so that we can move quickly and respond quickly uh, in the future. Erica, next slide. And so I'll just finish by, by thanking the team that's been involved. A uh, great news story that came out about the four students and, and now one graduate uh, in the lab that have actually been working on the ground uh, really nonstop over the last several weeks, uh, along with the rest of our support team. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be in the lab and work on these things under the current circumstances. That's not possible, but everybody's been doing just uh, really remarkable things from uh, home to help support this effort, whether it's ordering things or designing new constructs and what, what have you a number of different collaborators within the academic circles that we're working with here, as well as uh, the vaccine companies that we're uh, working with on, on bringing these ideas forward further. And then finally, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Alt Host Consortium, uh, which is a, a biopharmaceutical industry consortium uh, that we're uh, part of to advance the yeast host producing these products for funding. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think all of us are, are waiting for you and, and, and others like you to be successful in the development of vaccines because at the end of the day, uh, that's what will really get us out of this mess. Uh, so good luck to you. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me ask you some questions that have come up, Chris. The first has to do with, uh, you mentioned that you're already at the point of testing immunogenicity in mice, which is exciting. Um, roughly speaking, how predictive is the immunogenicity response in mice for what might happen in a person? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, I think typically mice is a first place to start with a lot of these. The next step after the immunogenicity demonstrations will be to think about neutralizing activity in, in appropriate models. Uh, the Gates Foundation through their network has set up a few different uh, groups that are capable of doing these in a variety of different models, whether it's ferrets or non-human primates. Uh, this is typically the next stage in kind of non-clinical work necessary to advance towards the clinic. I expect that the vaccine manufacturing companies that we're working with on this as well will also do their own tests in those regards. Uh, you got a question, Chris, which I think strikes directly at uh, one of your motivations. <clears throat> to what degree do you see this platform being used to do local manufacturing in different parts of the world? Yeah, that's a great question. I wish we were a little bit further ahead than where we are today, Tyler, but uh, you know, a lot of the concepts that we've been developing at MIT under uh, the Gates Foundation work in this area, as well as with the Department of Defense, has been thinking about small modular manufacturing. Uh, and these are very deployable type systems. Uh, they don't have the scale and capacity that a single facility might have, say 50,000 liter, but you could imagine numbering out these types of facilities to be able to reach regions or even specific areas that have you know, outbreaks of, of, uh, of the virus that you'd like to be able to contain through uh, more direct measures. You know, so manufacturing, say, 10 kilograms of product in a small modular manufacturing facility that has the capability of creating tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of doses kind of in a regional area. And so that's another strategy to think about here in terms of being ready for whatever's next uh, or the evolution of this is to start to think about line of sight to facilities around the world. A lot of the biology that we're developing now with the yeast-based hosts and the ability to directly integrate these genes in 
and with DNA synthesis such as it is, you really could just download the instructions to somewhere and make those site those yeast on site instead of having to ship cells around the world with dry ice and such as we found to be challenging in these circumstances. Yeah, and I'm going to end, Chris, by asking you about your your partnerships. You've mentioned the Gates Foundation, which has been supporting you for a while. Uh, so I'm curious about a comment about that partnership. And then you also mentioned working with pharmaceutical uh, with vaccine manufacturers. There, I don't need you to name names, and probably maybe you shouldn't. Um, but talk about the receptiveness that you've gotten from commercial entities. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think with actually with respect to both sets, uh, this is just a really unique time, as we all know. And I think, uh, you know, the Gates Foundation has been really fantastic to work with as part of this effort. Uh, they have a, a huge team that's thinking about every aspect of what it would take to bring these types of vaccines to everyone, uh, that's not just uh, whoever might have healthcare benefits to be able to provide that. And that's very much consistent with a lot of the things that we as the lab have been thinking about over the last few years as to how do you start thinking about reducing cost and availability of these. Uh, so they brought us directly into the conversations with a lot of the discovery groups and clinical teams. And uh, I've been on all kinds of late night phone calls to various parts of the world with various parts of their organization to, to try to understand what's the current latest and, and what's going on here. Uh, and I will just say the same about the vaccine manufacturing companies. I, I won't name names, but but you know, we've been working with them, uh, and it's been it's been really fantastic. They everyone wants to see this uh, move forward in some form, and I think right now you know we just need more shots on goal. We need as many things in the clinic as we can as we can realize, and I think in the end we're probably going to see multiple products of vaccines in different parts of the world. And some will be you know, best suited for certain, certain areas, certain groups, or even for certain cost targets. And so I think we need to try a lot of things right now. Great. Uh, Chris, I think we'll stop it there. Thank you again. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for a really enjoyable hour plus of uh, new projects with a, a lot of promise in a really important area. I, I congratulate you. Um, I'm impressed by your ability to transition your work so quickly to take on this, uh, this emerging threat. Um, over the next weeks, um, MIT research will, will come back slowly but surely. Uh, while we've been on, the, on this uh, meeting, Governor Baker here in Massachusetts has described his, his goal of opening up sectors of our economy starting on May 18th and ramping up from there. I think that would be a, 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 a cue to universities to begin to do the same. And as such, MIT research and Koch Institute research will um, begin to ramp up as well. Uh, we'll get back to our cancer research, um, which has not stopped, but has been slowed. And we will continue to do it uh, in earnest as, as the conditions allow. But so too will, will our COVID-19 research. Uh, the, one, the projects you've heard about, others that are ongoing that you didn't hear about, and I think still more. We're a talented group of of scientists and engineers who have lots of good ideas. Um, you hear about drug companies trying to repurpose old drugs uh, to find new strategies for this disease. We're repurposing bright minds uh, to find new strategies to control this disease. And, and I'm very impressed and grateful to my colleagues for their efforts in that regard. I thank the audience. Um, we, we, we got up to 370 people at one point during the presentation. That's way more than we typically are able to do in a with insight presentation at the Koch Institute. And because we were able to reach so many more people, I think we'll do this again. I think this was highly successful. Thank you for participating. And I, and I wanna thank Erica Reinfeld and her colleagues uh, for pulling this together. It's the first time we've done it. I think it worked extremely well. Um, so thank you and uh, be safe out there. Take care.